Hey, what's going on guys? Phil here, back with another video where I wanted to talk about something kind of weird and kind of specific, but that's kind of how every video on this channel is anyway, so at this point I probably don't even need that caveat. Today I want to talk about innovation in design and how that can relate to Hearthstone cards and what I mean by innovation in design exactly. Essentially, I want to talk about cards and how to design cards that push boundaries, uh, make players think to themselves and feel like, wow, I can't believe I never thought of this before. And how can we as designers get to, you know, wrap our minds around how to make these kinds of cards uh, more often, you know? more. How can we make more well-designed cards that make our players feel something? That's the biggest thing for me, right? So it's pretty common in most card game communities that as new sets get revealed, then there's going to be discussion posts or, you know, friends are going to talk like, hey, did you see this card? What do you think? How strong is it? How good it is? is it? Blah, 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 blah. What's it do? How excited are you for it? And a lot of the time, the cards that get a lot of the spotlight are the big flashy legendaries or, you know, some of the big, some of the early aggressive minions or the most thematic cards. And while all of those have their place, the cards that always catch my eye tend to be ones that are a little bit different. And I want to start this off by giving the example of a card which made me think about making this video in the first place, right? So, Jerry Rig Carpenter is a 2 mana 2-1 two that says, Battlecry, draw a choose one spell and split it. And splitting it gives you each of its halves as full cost spells. So if I was to draw Wrath, I get a 2 mana deal 3 to a minion, and I get a 2 mana deal 1 to a minion and draw a card. Now, why would this card potentially stand out to me if I'm thinking on a purely design, you know, perspective? Why is this card so interesting to me? Well, it's pretty simple, right? It's a very innovative card, and right now that doesn't have a definition, but I'm about to give you that definition, right? So, the way that I would define an innovative card, or innovation in general, uh, specifically when it relates to card games, right? It would be stuff like new mechanics. So every set's going to have new mechanics. Obviously, you're going to be pushing the envelope there. There's going to be stuff that you've never tried before because every mechanic's going to be different. Otherwise, it wouldn't be its own mechanic. Then... There's the idea of unexplored design space, opening up things that we haven't done before, right? So, um, this one is a pretty good example, honestly. There's not many cards that interact with choose one spells. Uh, there's not many choose one spells that have been printed in the, you know, fairly recently. Choose one is kind of a keyword that's fallen by the wayside as the games progress, but it's always been a very core druid theme. So having it be kind of resurrected in a new set instantly is going to catch someone's eye if they've been a long time player. And it's going to, you know, instantly inspire them to think of, oh, what are all the choose one cards, choose, choose one cards that this affects and how does that affect them all? And all of a sudden you you've given your players so much to think about that they haven't thought about before. And that's a very good hallmark of a innovative card is, is it something that allows players, that changes how players think about a large batch of cards all at once? Um, yeah, that's how, I think that's, that's the key fundamental point, right? Innovative cards are going to make a player think about many, many different things. The implications of this one card are massive, potentially massive. And your player is now going to have all of that information to think about and process, and that's a very good experience, okay? That's something that you want your players to have. You want them to be constantly, like, excited and thinking about your new stuff. So, uh, yeah. This was a very good first example. But I also had a couple others that I wanted to bring up, and each of them are going to have points associated that kind of push the definition a little bit more um, or explain or go into other concepts of why cards may be well designed. But I wanted this to be mainly focused upon 
examples of cards that I found to be very innovative for whatever reason, and I will give those reasons as we go. My second one is the Deep Water Evoker. Okay, the Deep Water Evoker is a very, you know, kind of quiet card. It's a four mana, three four, not great stats. Th uh, battle cry, draw a spell and gain armor equal to its costs. Now, why would this seem to be an innovative card, right? Or a well-designed card? So, one of the things that was pushed heavily in this set is Big Spell Mage, okay? And Big Spell Mage, while it's not required, a lot of the uh, cards that support Big Spell Mage require that your spells cost essentially five or more. And if you're going to be playing a style of deck where a majority of your cards cost five or more, then you're going to take damage in the early game. So you're going to need to have some form of survivability, some form of life gain, most likely. And as a mage, you have no life gain in your entire kit. You have armor gain. And there is a one armor gain card that you own in standard, and that's Frost Barrier, right? Frost Barrier has been a staple in Mage forever in Control Mage. And that's because it's really good. It's 3 mana gain 8. And it's a secret, so sometimes that, you know, can matter if you run multiple secrets or if you randomly generate stuff. And it's a very staple card. Now, that card is particularly bad in Big Spell Mage, right? Because it does not... It's Not only does it not synergize with your things that want your spells to be 5 or more... It outright just has anti-synergy with them. Um, if you take, say, Dragon's Fury, that's a wild card, but it'll fit in this example. Five mana, reveal, reveal a spell from your deck and deal its damage to all minions. Well, if you, you know, 90% of the time hit a 7 or above with that, and then 10% of the time, because of your Ice Bears, you hit a 3, there's a 10% of the time chance that just based on the deck building restriction that, hey, I'm a control deck, so I'm probably going to need life, but the only life gain I have is Frost Barrier. Just because of that restriction, you would lose 10% of your game sometimes, you know, potentially. And as a player, that feels really bad because there are no other options. And it's, it's something that, you know, you feel like shouldn't be an issue. And that's where this card comes in. This card, while it's not the most innovative in the ways where I already talked about, you know, it didn't it open up much design space. It's just armor gain. It's no new mechanic. And it doesn't change how you think about other cards that much. This thought exercise that we just went through of determining whether this card is better or worse than Frost Barrier for a player who has never had to have that kind of thought process, this is a very big moment for them, right? It's massive. There's Every time you're learning a game, you're going to always have a massive learning curve at first, right? But even once you feel like you understand a lot behind a game, there's so much complexity behind the scenes that you will slowly, you know, eventually come upon. So even if I think that I know how to play the game really well, maybe I'm not a great deck builder, and I come upon this problem of, hey, my Frost Barrier hurts my deck, and I need an alternative. I'm going to try this. Giving a player the opportunity to make this connection is huge, 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 right? It's one of the most important things, because as long as you can keep a player engaged and continually thinking on higher levels and continually thinking they're getting better, then they're going to stick with your game more often. It's one of the best feelings you can have a player experience is I thought of something, I ran into a problem, and I was able to solve my way out of my problem thanks to how well designed the game is. You know, it's... I feel like there should be a better way to end that point, but I'm not quite sure how to get there. But I think that the feeling that I'm trying to represent with that got through. So hopefully it did. Um, but with that, let's move on to the next card that I want to talk about, which is Righteous Defense. 
Okay. Righteous Defense. Three mana, set a minion's attack and health to one, and give the stats that it lost to a minion in your hand. This kind of goes back to the issue solving that uh, Deep Water Evoker also had, right? So it solved a very apparent issue in an archetype where, hey, Big Spell Mage still needs survivability, but it can't particularly afford to run a low cost spell. Well, Hand Buff Paladin. A traditionally aggressive deck, or more tempo-y, but now that it's in standard, it is very much an aggressive deck. It has no removal. It has very few options for ever coming back from behind. And a lot of the hand buff tools are geared in this aggressive fashion, right? So there's like the 3-mana 2-2 two, two Alliance Bannerman, who gives all your minions plus 1, plus 1. That's cool. Um, but... Buffing your entire hand with something like that or with Smuggler's Run or with Grime Street Outfitter, that's a much different kind of hand buff effect than massively buffing one minion, right? There's very little massively buff one minion in my hand. There is Don Honcho in Wild, which was like the original hand buff guy. There's High Lord Four Dragon, which kind of does that, but it's not, it's unreliable. Um,. And this solves an issue while also opening up design space, right? So most hand buff leans aggressive or tempo because it buffs your entire hand. This counteracts, kind of contradicts that, not counteracts that, contradicts that precedent where uh, hand buff will be a widespread buff rather than just a single targeted buff. And so that can open up interesting design space where let's say you need let's say you're in wild and your deck really badly needs like lifesteal and survivability well if you massively buff up a what's the two mana one three lifesteal rush guy called you buff up him by like eight eight with this card all of a sudden you've opened up way more survivability options for your deck than previously possible and this still also has a place in the tempo style decks because as removal options go, that deck has none. And as like a tempo-y option, you could run like Aldor, but Aldor sucks. I would much rather run this and then get a bigger payoff minion than have a 3-3, right? So it's just, it covers a lot of bases. It is different from other hand buff, but still familiar enough that we understand, you know, as players, how it's going to function. And it, soar, it shores up the issues that um, Hand of Paladin can face where, you know, one big taunt minion comes down and all of a sudden you're just shit out of luck. It takes you like four minions, even though they're all buffed to trade into that. You've lost all your tempo and this gives you not an answer to that. So that's pretty cool. Then we have Seek Guidance, and this one will come back more to the real innovation factor rather than the issue-solving innovation factor, right? So, questline, play a 2, 3, and 4 cost card, then it becomes play a 5 and 6, then it becomes play a 7 and an 8. Now, why is this innovative? Well, one, questlines in general as a mechanic were very innovative. They were very, uh, you know... People weren't sure if we were ever going to get quests that had multiple segments, if we were ever going to get quests that had smaller rewards. Because uh, we had side quests, but side quests, for the most part, were not very successful as a mechanic. So seeing them revived in a way and kind of seeing the mix between a normal quest and a side quest with these was very interesting. That's design space that ver was very obviously open. Because uh, there's a lot to be done still with, you know quest style cards where you have a very consistent turn one there's design space potential still open with like start of game um stuff that we've seen before but just needs polishing right but this also makes you think very very heavily about almost every single card in the game right if you take a list of every hearthstone card and you exclude the two three four five six seven and eight cost cards you're really not looking at that many so all of those options 
you now have to potentially look at in a different way, right? Because now they might be a useful part of your quest completion plan. So along with this set came a seven mana card called Elec Mount, and that card on its face is kind of bad. It's very, very uh, open to being silenced. It's extremely slow. It's not like i mean plus four plus seven is an interesting buff i wouldn't call it good um the death rattle effect itself is like kind of cool but it's it's overall not like a particularly strong card but specifically because you need seven cost cards and every other seven cost card kind of sucks all of a sudden you've now thought about that card in a different way and put it into this deck and so you have to do that for every single mana cost and it just opens up hundreds of thousands of deck building options for this for this card right and anything that gives a player hours and hours of potential like thought exercises to think through or like hey you know small optimization i wonder if my oh what well, god Imagine I put in River Crocolisk and I'm like, ooh, I should put in Plated Beetle because it's the same card but slightly better. Like, you're you're consistently just keeping your player thinking about a ton of different variables, trying to figure out in which ways they can manipulate things to make things slightly better or more efficient. And that it this opens up so much of that space in a player's mind to like take up that it's just it they're there's no way you could exclude it from a well-designed, well-thought-out card. Uh, next, I have, in the same vein, sketchy information. As you read this card, the options just instantly unlock, and it unlocks so naturally that even players that don't think they're thinking on that high of a level will be able to go through these steps uh, without having it be explicitly explained to them. So... Three mana, draw a death rattle card. As soon as we read that, our brain is popping off thinking, let me think of every single death rattle card, and do I want to tutor it? What death rattles could I potentially want to tutor that are that good? Then you keep reading, that costs four or less. Okay, well that narrows my search down, but that, you know, that makes sense for power level. Okay, so now I have to think of death rattles that cost four or less that I want to tutor. And then you read it, the last part, it says triggers death rattle, and you're like, okay. Maybe there's cards that have death rattles that are very, very good, but like their stats are terrible, so I want to use those. There there used to be a four mana one one that death rattle summoned a five five. That could be kind of cool. Um and it just it makes you think of many different cards all at once that you may not have thought of before. The most common card to be played with this is the Lone Shark, right? Three mana, three, four, give your opponent a coin, death rattle, give yourself two coins. That card by itself is pretty scary to play. If you've ever played Arena and you played Soldier of Fortune against someone, those coins that they get add, can add up very, very quickly. Uh, Hearthstone's a very tempo-based game, and so giving your opponent access to any sort of ramp even in in the form of temporary ramp is huge so being able to circumvent the bad battle cry of lone shark to just trigger its death rattle is a very good uh use of this card and one that takes a lot of thinking to get through now that combo specifically especially because they were both released in the same set was more obvious than uh you know, I might be giving it, giving this credit for. But not every card that's designed in this way is going to have such an obvious, oh, hey, maybe we should try this out with it. Um, and so this kind of style of design, even if sometimes there are answers that are more obvious than others as, like, good answers, it still keeps your players thinking, and maybe someday we find something better than Lone Shark to play with this, right? And then that opens up just a million different possibilities there, because it just makes you reconsider every single Death Rattle card that has been printed, is printed in this current set, and will f be printed in future, particularly within a standard rotation, right? 
Um, lastly, I, actually not lastly, I have two more, but this one will not take long because it's in the same vein as uh, the monstrous parrot, which I'm also going to bring up. So the brilliant macaw, three mana three three battle cry repeat the last battle cry you played, and the monstrous parrot. Let's do parrot. There we go. This guy. Four mana three four battle cry. Repeat the last friendly death rattle that triggered. We've never really had cards that referenced previous triggers before. And so that opens up design space that previously was unknown to be explorable, right? As a player, if something is not made, it you can assume it will not be made sometimes, right? There's some things that you're just like, oh, I guess this is something we don't do. Hearthstone does not create tokens you know magic creates lots of token copies of stuff hearthstone does not i would not consider tokens to ever be in the design space of hearthstone however up until now we have never had cards that referenced past triggers so now that this card and the macaw have been printed that opens up so much more design space now because now depending on how complex they want to you know push it with more keywords and stuff like that, it's very easy, or especially keywords that, like, kind of work off of triggers. Uh, that This definition kind of derailed into a lot of vocabulary terms. But essentially, there's not many f cards that do what these do. These fit into very specific decks for the most part and fill a very important role in helping them have consistency right um death rattle hunter its biggest issue was since you're playing death rattles it's obviously going to end up being a slower kind of grindy early game uh or just grindy game in general because you need to get value out of your things dying uh and hunter doesn't like being slow so this helps regain the tempo after you've you know potentially fallen behind in the early game a uh on the flip side for the macaw it uh helps regain a lot of tempo no matter what it's a very fast card but it can fit into a lot of different archetypes so it fits into aggressive decks that have good battle cries it fits into like aggro shaman if you really really wanted to push it um but it also opens up design space to make something like nazoth uh menagerie shaman right that deck with only one copy of nazoth and only one like board refill it's very susceptible to just losing to one AOE um, or to just never drawing the cards that you need to draw like this off. But now that that uh, Macaw exists, you can you can potentially have up to three triggers of your Nazoth, and now all of a sudden you have a very useful grindy, uh, you know, win condition. And they're just both very versatile, and I really liked how crisp they were. You know, they, they aren't the most innovative but they're very interesting to think about it makes you reconsider every death rattle card every battle cry card uh particularly the ones that are low cost because you want to take advantage of the tempo gain from these cards as early as possible so if i see that this costs four mana this uh hunter one the first thing that comes to mind is i want a death rattle that costs three or less oh hey you know it's a pretty decent death rattle that's three or less that's a little bit too slow sometimes um the bloated python i get a four four so if i end up killing my one two on turn four i get a four four i play this it's a four mana three four that death rattle is a four four and that's really good you know that that helps make up for the fact that on turn three i played a one two and then the last card i want to bring up is sucker hook four mana three six at the end of your turn transform your weapon into one that costs one more now why is this an innovative card right well evolve in of itself is is not particularly innovative right it's a mechanic that's come back a lot in many different forms and they're always in different in different fun interesting forms right so there's the original evolve there's the revolve that targets one minion with echo there's devolve there's revolve and all of these mechanics are very iconic they're all very fairly strong cards they were very important in the meta at one point or another 
and Evolve is just a well-liked mechanic overall, I think. It's, it's very fun. But they've always just affected minions. And until you see this card, you probably don't think to yourself, hey, I expect the Hearthstone team to make a card that evolves my weapons, right? It opens a lot of design space for different weapons that say, I don't know, maybe now you can actually afford to just play like the 2-2 Auction Master Gavel because you get a hit a value out of it, you reduce something in your hand, and then you play this and you just start infinitely sca like scaling your 2-2s. It also, weapons, especially particularly for Shaman, are typically uh, low costed, and so as top decks in the late game, they're fairly weak. If you're able to combo them with something like this, at least you're trying to get you're able to get more value out of them than you previously were able to. And it being a one having a mechanic so unique on it that we've never seen before, like evolving your weapon, that's innovative in of itself. But also just pushing weapon synergy in general. Um, or pushing weapons to viability when weapons in the late game are such a bad draw. Uh, that Thinking along that line, like giving more chances for cards to be useful in different ways uh, is typically a good sign. So, yeah. Hopefully my points made at least some amount of sense. We jumped around a little bit. I'll be honest... Going through and planning for this video was very difficult because talking about design, there's so many different loophole like loops and rabbit holes you can dive into that kind of get a little bit too off topic. Staying on staying on focus is very difficult when doing these kinds of videos, especially because they're not super scripted. Like I have slight notes, but um Sometimes, you know, you kind of just go off the deep end. Uh, I think I did fairly well at being somewhat succinct. Um, I don't know if succinct is the word. Somewhat concise with my explanations. And I hope that leaving this video, you understand that what I was trying to say is that when designing cards, it's very important to be innovative. And there's many different ways to be innovative, but there... As, as designers, we should look at games that we enjoy or that we appreciate and want to, you know, kind of follow in their footsteps. We want to learn how, how where are the patterns to wh how we can learn to make cards like this, right? And so the pattern that we learned today was typically cards that are innovative or exciting or very... Uh, De like have a lot of depth to them they typically have that because they explore design space that has previously been unexplored uh we tackle different uh parameters in different ways than previously right so like with the priest quest we have to consider mana costs mana costs are not typically something that outside of being maintaining a decent curve we think very often about uh with sucker hook we have to think about our weapons and what weapons cost on the next what weapons can i potentially get on the next tier that's information that is not typically uh at the forefront of a player's mind um with sketchy information we have to think about every death rattle card and see you know just consider is are any of these options viable and as long as you're maintaining your player's interest by keeping them thinking about different aspects of your game then you're doing your job correctly in designing in you know making well-designed cards so yeah thank you guys so much for watching uh if you have any feedback or any thoughts leave it down in the comments below and i will talk to you guys next time